So leading this afternoon's session is Roger Camras, who as an original pioneer of today's internet in the 70s at MIT, has been helping organizations across the globe harness the power of new technologies for over five decades. And I think we're just about set up. So please join me in welcoming Roger and his panelists to the stage. A very good afternoon to all of you today, and uh, thanks so much for giving us your time, and I hope your attention. Uh, this is an enormously important topic that we're going to discuss this afternoon, and I have to say I have some foreboding about how fast and how far the world is actually responding to the challenges that we are experiencing. And just the last two days, our confirmation that we are indeed in a in a climate change that may be irreversible. Anyway, I'm delighted firstly to welcome an extremely well-qualified uh, panel. Uh, I've spoken to all of them uh, prior to this event. I know that they're going to uh, have some very insightful views as to what can be done to avert a major global crisis. So what I'd like to do is to firstly very briefly introduce the panel uh, I'll then provide a little context, um, and then I have a series of questions, and we'll go person by person through the panel with each individual question, uh, so you'll get a really uh, diverse and hopefully a very uh, powerful view of what sustainability is all about. And just referring to the title, uh, Hyperscaling for Change, Exploring Opportunities that Technology Can Play in driving sustainability. So just as a very brief uh, introduction, uh, the first uh, gentleman on my left here is uh, Stuart Birrell, uh, of Chief Data and Information Officer of EasyJet. So very warm welcome to you. Uh, Elena is from, uh, she's the Head of Sustainability for Oracle, uh, which of course is one of the world leaders in uh, technology. Uh, um, the next one is uh, Kerrick, from IBM, again, executive partner, global sustainability strategy, and UK sustainability team lead. I hope I got that one right. Uh, Maureen, who I've known for a good long time, uh, a very distinguished career in supply chain in GSK, uh, and now again, an, another good long title, uh, not a chair of Medicine Manufacturing Innovation Center Supervisory Board at CPI and I know Maureen's doing some fantastic innovative work up in Scotland. So again, welcome to you. Uh, Rob, uh, Rob Doble, uh, who is the EY UK Partner for Sustainability. Again, uh, very busy right now, I believe, <laughs> uh, in helping uh, large organizations cope with uh, their sustainability agenda. Uh, delighted to, uh, to have Brad uh, Petrus uh, join us. He's the Director of Business Development, AI and Machine Learning at R Squared Factory, which is uh, uh, owned by Rolls-Royce. So again, uh, a very warm welcome to you. And last, but by no means least, uh, Andy Foster, uh, who is the IT Head of Corporate Services at Jaguar Land Rover. So I think you can see from this diversity, uh, we're covering a lot of industries uh, and a lot of ground here. So uh, I think the conversations uh, will be highly relevant, not just to the aerospace industry, but much more broadly. But I'd just like to start with a little context. So I think we all talk about the importance of sustainability. Uh, we all, all the politicians, all the chief executives, constantly rousing us to this important challenge. And yet what's actually going on on the ground? I mean, that's the real question we're asking this afternoon. Uh, are we actually doing what is necessary to achieve uh, net zero by 2030? It's eight years away. Now, personally, I'm the research director of Europe's largest IT community. We have 12,000 
CIOs, CDOs, and CTOs as part of our community. And we've been talking to them constantly for the last couple of years about sustainability. I have to say, it, it doesn't even enter the top 10 uh, category, category of uh, IT priorities today. What's at the top of that list of top priorities? It's cybersecurity. And why is cybersecurity there? Because if you don't address cybersecurity, your organization can be out of business. Now, where should sustainability be? Uh, if we don't address sustainability, we're not only out of business, the whole of the planet has collapsed. So I think we've got a, uh, an interesting discussion here between why is cyber so important and why is sustainability not in the top 10 uh, agenda items of the CIO? So I think that's the, the, the first thing I would say. Uh, the, the second thing, of course, is, you know, will the politicians really get this right? Well, sadly, they're distracted, are they not? They've got the war in Ukraine, they've got the recession, they've got inflation. Uh, everything at the moment is deflecting attention from sustainability. And even if it, it, attention was there, have we actually got the funding to achieve a major global change in, in direction? Uh, this is going to cost us trillions of dollars. And we're just out of pocket uh, after the pandemic, after the recession, after uh, the crash in 2008. We're spent up. So where's the money going to come from? I think the lesson today that I would really like to pursue with, the, uh, with the, this distinguished panel is we in IT can do something. We can't solve the world's problems today, sadly, but we can do something about cleaning up our own backyard. And what do I mean there? Well, IT is responsible for between 4 and 5% of global carbon emissions. Most of you have never seen a data center. You don't even know where they are. But believe me, they're throwing out a lot of, a, a lot of carbon emissions. And we all know we're heading to a, a digital economy. Uh, I would reckon that by 2030, at least 10% of global carbon emissions will come from IT. So that is an immediate call for action. What are we doing collectively here today in the IT industry to clean up our own backyard? It's a tough question. Why? Because most of us don't even know what we've got in our own backyard. I mean, do any of us know what systems, what legacy systems, what applications exist in very large complex organizations? We may have 50 data centers. Some of our uh, community have 100 data centers. Do they really know what the baseline looks like in terms of carbon emissions? Without knowing that, without having the data, and we'll talk about data, it's difficult to start plotting a journey towards zero, uh, car, uh, uh, net zero. So the first thing to do is to actually understand what the current situation looks like in IT, and then we can start to plan how we improve that situation. And clearly, there's a, a very strong collaboration here. We have Oracle. We have a number of uh, CIOs uh, between the providers of, of technology uh, and the users of technology. And again, that's got to grow. And that's got to be a combined effort so that we really can uh, cut through the, the current ignorance that exists. So how do we get this onto the agenda? How do we make? Uh, sustainability, the big number one issue alongside cyber in the next couple of years. Because if we can't, if it's delegated down to the 15th or 20th place, we're all lost, are we not? So that's the big impassioned plea that I would bring to us all this afternoon. We've got to change, we've got to change uh, our approach to sustainability. And IT is a particularly important part of that equation. Uh, we do have the capabilities, we do have the tools, we've got to deploy them within our own organizations, and once we've been successful there, we've got to deploy them amongst our business partners. So that's really the context, and I hope that this event will be a seminal event. It's a call for action, and once we leave the room here, our obligation is to make sure that, certainly in the case of CIONET, Every one of our 12,000 community members 
understands the profound implications of what we're going to talk about now. So that is, as I say, context setting, uh, uh, and I'm really delighted, firstly, to call on Stuart Birrell, uh, Chief Data and Information Officer. And I'd like to know, you know what are the tactical uh, approaches that EasyJet is employing today to reduce carbon emissions? Clearly, you're in a highly visible industry, uh, but you are in charge of technology. So uh, what are you doing about it, Stuart? Um, quite a lot, but I'd like to echo that the lack of... The amount of conversation I have with peers across industries on sustainability is pretty much zero. Yeah. Um, and I think getting the conversation going. Um, and part of the, the challenge, I think, is most of us don't really know what to do. Sustainability is fuel. It's, it, it's too big. It's not in our remit. Yeah. But actually, there's a lot we can do. And when I look at what we're doing in EasyJet, um, the, the, the short term, the stuff that's in our immediate grasp is things like the your, your infrastructure your data centers you know we're in the process of uh, moving everything out to aws um, it's a 90 odd percent reduction in carbon footprint from the data centers now we're already in aws for two-thirds of our compute we're rebuilding with ml ai at the heart of it so really optimizing what you do so you get a double double benefit a you go there but you get real benefit and uh, productivity and that's in every CIO's gift so it's not rocket science it's not difficult to do you need the motivation uh, and will and support of the company to go and do that it gets more interesting when you start applying our knowledge and capabilities in IT to other parts of the business and what I mean that is that things like how do you go and apply AI ML to different parts so um, we, we have a project underway at the moment on um, takeoff and landing profiles. Every pilot, whether you're Airbus or Boeing, they have standard profiles for takeoff and climb and standard profiles for descent. If you go and change that depending on the weather, the load, mm -hmm. the wind direction, you can actually save about five, six percent of your fuel on takeoff and landing. Wow. That's tens of millions to us. Yeah. You know, so there's a irrespective of the carbon side of that, there's an economic benefit, and a very, very significant economic benefit from that. I mean, the cost, that's a, it's at least a 10x return on any investment we get on in that. So there's a huge uh, potential in there. You start investing in uh, some of the other, uh, on the trials we've just done recently with uh, uh, Eurocontrol on optimizing flight routes across Europe. Um, it cut 8% of fuel. That's, again, that's billions to this industry, and tens of millions of tons of fuel. Now it needs collaboration. That needs Euro control yep. uh, and uh, uh, Cesar, single European skies, yes. to work. There is zero political will for that to happen right now. So there's a 8% cut that we could go and do easily as an industry, and it's well documented, yep. uh, it's well proven. Cesar, is it ever going to happen? Probably not. It's kind of my, that's a personal view, but there's a will. And so there's a, that's politicians. It's about nationalism and national control. So there's a lot out there that we can do and applying our capability to business problems, which have got huge economic benefit, irrespective of the uh, car, I think is a huge potential for us. So it's not just the data center, it's everything that we do. That's very encouraging, Stuart, but I do think we have to start in our own backyard. And, oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm not going to pursue the AWS issue quite yet, but I will come back to that. But are we throwing the problem over the fence to our lovely cloud providers? And for that purpose, I'd really like to talk to Eleanor uh, from Oracle because you have uh, set out yourself to uh, really tackle this big problem, uh, uh, and you're a very influential partner in this industry. So I'd love to know, how, do you, how did you get started? How did you mobilize your organization to make a difference? We launched our program in, back in 2008. And I'm one of the two founding members of the sustainability, uh, sustainability group. And back then, there was the expectation that in the US, uh, the Obama administration was going to um, pass carbon legislation, which obviously didn't happen. But we started looking at sustainability as a business opportunity. So we looked at what our products and solutions could do to help organizations decarbonize. 
And um, obviously, because it was linked to product development and to sales, we got buy-in by the executives. They said, okay, explore the opportunity. So we started um, looking at um, embedding sustainability capabilities into our core products. You know, as you know, we provide all sorts of enterprise applications for financial, supply chain management, customer experience. And that's how the uh, sustainability program was launched. And to these days, it's still the sort of fil rouge, the, 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 the mantra of what we, um, we think sustainability is. You have to embed sustainability in your day-to-day -day operations, in your IT systems. And it changed over time in the sense that um, there was an initial uh, interest from customers back then that faded uh, into the background. Uh, that um, meant that my team started focusing more on what we do internally as an organization, and we developed the, the program uh, from an internal perspective, building alliances within the different functions within the company. Um, that took some time. You know, you know, the challenge when you run a sustainability program is that you're often asking um, your colleagues to do more work, to change the way they work. Um, the default answer is always no, <laughs> which I always took as not yet. <laughs> and um, eventually, when you start figuring out who can really help, you build a strong momentum within the organization, and then you start progressing more and more towards more aggressive goals. And now, obviously, it's, it's you know we are, we are the superstars of, of the company. You know, we for many years we were the lonely voice in the desert. Now, it's really a strong momentum, and customers are back into into the conversation. So, they are really reaching out to ask how we can help in collecting data, managing data, you know, help them with ESG reporting, um, support their transition towards a low-carbon economy. So we are moving from focusing on what we do internally, and it's something I can talk about in terms of our work as AWS on, on data center efficiency and carbon neutrality, towards what we can do for customers with our technology. And that is currently the, the key focus of our program. So Eleanor, you said that your customers are now seeking your support. I mean, I think that's the big breakthrough, isn't it? Yep. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm not hearing that from 12,000 CIOs in Europe. They're not banging on your door or anyone else's door right now. Uh, it's hard even to get them to a meeting to talk about sustainability. The, Where is this coming from? The, the conversations we're having are with, not with the IT teams, but with the uh, business, uh, with the C-suite. Um, and my, you know, uh, experience is that in, within these organizations, the IT uh, people are now talking to their sustainability counterparts. Wow. Uh, and um, the, the majority of the customers we talk to are handling sustainability metrics via Excel. The data is always often disconnected from what they do in financials, and you probably can confirm, right? And so that, that means that it's very difficult to audit uh, data, uh, get accurate information. So all the potential of, of, um, of AI and machine learning capabilities that we have in our tools is just not there because you don't have enough data in the system, right? So what I call the nirvana of ESG reporting, you get you know, data in your, you know, in, a, in that data model, you, you can slice and dice it, based on your sustainability initiatives and uh, you know, map your supply chain risk, uh, figure out what, where you could decarbonize. It's challenging if you don't have the data to begin with. And, and I think what we are trying to do when we talk to customers is trying to involve the IT teams up front because it's where you do an, an implementation of a software application that, that you have to write, ask the right questions. And, if you don't ask the question, the data is never going to be part of your day-to-day -day management. We're having a little bit of competition up in the skies yes. here, but don't, <laughs> don't worry, Let, let's press on. But I think you've raised a, a really important point here. Uh, <coughs> if it's the businesses that are driving the sustainability agenda rather than IT, 
I think we need to come back to that. Uh, surely both have to drive that agenda. Uh, uh, Carrick, uh, again, warm welcome to you from IBM. Uh, I mean, again, clearly an enormously influential, important organization through the history of IT. Uh, I mean, how, how do you see the responsibility of mobilizing uh, amongst our digital leaders, our CIOs? Uh, are, do you think that they're all very passive, uh, waiting for orders, or are they really taking steps to make a difference here? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't see them being passive, to be honest. Good. So, I mean, you know, we are, and, and it's a question of what you're, the, the actual question you're asking. Yeah. So if, yeah. if you're asking a pure play sustainability question, then, then you might get a kind of a lukewarm res response. If you're actually asking a question which is around, how do I optimize? How do I kind of drive efficiency? How do I reduce energy use? Yeah. How do I, that's, that's a different question. Right. And that, that's actually all about efficiency, effectiveness. It yeah. happens also to be about sustainability. Because if yes. you're looking at sustainability from a technology perspective, yeah. an awful lot of the good practices that you want are actually good practices. Yes. They just happen to be sustainable as well. Yeah. So, so, you know, if, if you're kind of looking at this from a, from a computing side of things, you know, we do a lot of work which is looking at, at actually sort of how do you do efficient coding. Yes. So actually, so yeah. from a coding perspective, how is it structured? How do you minimize the usage? Um, how do you minimize the power usage, the processing usage, yeah. and actually sort of how you get into some of those pieces? I mean, there's elements in there as well which we also need to get into which are not carbon related. And there's a whole conversation which is around bias. And actually, sort of, you know, we are effectively building the future systems. Um, and if we're building bias into those future systems, generally unconsciously in lots of cases, then actually, you know, they are going to act in a particular way, which actually may not be beneficial to all in society. So we need to be thinking about sort of how we build some of those components in as part of the process too. What you're then looking at is, <clears throat> is optimization of data centers. Yep. Um, some of them do need to be on-prem. You have no choice because there's, there's certain pieces that you want to keep there. And, uh, and actually, those are usually the more difficult to do the loading piece on, just because you don't get the throughput you would. You know, going to sort of AWS and, and the likes actually are very good and efficient at sort of managing the load side of things. And it's then how you build in elements around sort of the carbon side. Just speak up a little bit. Sure. As I say, competing with the, uh, the Sky Show. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, and, and what you're then doing is you're looking at sort of whether you can actually sort of manage the, the kind of the, the sustainability components there. Yes. And again, there's, there's, there's tech. I mean, we have a research team who spends their life working how to sort of rebalance your load in order to be able to actually place it in the most efficient spaces, usually from a processing perspective, but actually that could be from a sustainability perspective as well. So, so all of that then plays through. And then if you're looking at the hardware itself, um, you know, from a, a company perspective, you know, we're still a hardware seller, despite yep. the fact we yep. have disposed of a whole variety of companies that do, do hardware, but we do mainframe still. You know, 97.7% of that is recycled. Um, and the bits, a lot of the bits that aren't are because we actually have to, to dispose of them in a particular way in order to, to for, from a data integrity perspective. So, so, you know, what we're looking at there is actually how do you kind of make sure from a full life cycle perspective, the kit itself is yes. also as sustainable as possible. Now, again, n none of this is new. So th these elements we've been doing for a while, they may have been dressed in a slightly different way, but we have been doing them for quite some time. Actually, what the sustainability piece is doing is actually adding another lens to, to really focus it down. You know, as, as an IT team, you can make a really significant contribution to the broader play around sustainability. And actually, in the short term, to be honest, it's probably one of the easier places to go. So you can kind of hit some decent targets, yep. get some decent numbers, put them onto your glide path, um, and, and, and do that early. Um, and, and they should absolutely be part of those, those early wins, but they should also be a, absolutely a part of your long-term strategy. So I think you made a, a very important point here. Firstly, people are rewriting their major uh, applications uh, to go to cloud. I mean, there's a massive effort going on right now to completely re rewrite, re-platform vast numbers of applications and all the big corporates that actually takes a lot of compute power. Mm -hmm. So it's a big one-off, but it's, a, it's a, a peak, I would guess. Uh, the second thing, as you rightly say, is going to cloud. Uh, hopefully, uh, the AD, AD, uh, AWSs, the Azures of this world, are actually um, delivering sustainable environments, but we don't really know, do we? Uh, and I think the, um, the other question is data itself. I think it was IBM who said, 80% of all data in the world has been created in the last two years. 
uh, that's an explosion in, in information. Where's it going? You know, uh, it has to sit on servers somewhere. Uh, so I think we, we, we see, as, as I've said, 4 or 5% today of, of carbon emissions from IT, ultimately 10%, 15% even, perhaps. So, you know, again, the, the message today is we do have to look at ourselves as well as to look at our businesses. Uh, there's great potential. Uh, as you rightly say, maybe it's quite easy, <laughs> uh, but we've got to do it. But I, th I think it depends on what it is as well. So, yes. I mean, we've got to be a bit careful that we don't sort of gently sort of ease ourselves into, into a cul-de-sac. Because <laughs> there's, there's, there's parts of this which actually you can absolutely do and get an incremental improvement. Yeah. But actually, it doesn't fundamentally change the game. So you were talking about transformation. Yes. Well, actually, and you were talking as well about some of the transformation pieces outside in the business. You know, we need to be thinking about actually how the corporate needs to transform. And actually, you know, how does that then get supported and what's the structuring and the right... So that we don't end up, you know, going on this glide path, getting to a point in two or three years where actually we've done the stuff which is incrementally easy to do, yes. but we still haven't done the transformational. Absolutely. Um, and so it's actually how do, you do, how do you do that and do it in a way where you don't end up also you know, wasting an awful lot of money to then actually find that you have to scrap it and go a different direction entirely. Thank you very much. So Maureen, I know, you know through your career you've looked after manufacturing, you've looked after supply chain, you've looked after IT. Uh, you, you've got a panoramic view, I think, of, of where phar pharma actually operates. Uh, do you think the farmers grasp the nettle here? Do they really understand uh, the nature of sustainability in your sector? What are they doing about it, Maureen? I think it's a good question, Roger. So I think farmers actually got two contributions that we can make. Firstly, looking at the medicines that we all take, yep. um, devices or healthcare interventions re-engineering looking at those and making them more sustainable to help us all really live longer and you know have better products in order to do so i think the, the second intervention really is looking at ourselves our own backyard yep. um like tech actually i think you said four percent well actually global healthcare is four percent of carbon emissions as well and that takes into account the hospital sector as well as the pharmaceutical industry um pharma is probably about 20 percent of that Done. now there's a huge backyard of factories, labs, and uh, hospitals in order to drive improvement. And, and Roger, they've started. So uh, there's been a lot done starting to look at green energy and um, renewable energy yep. and how they actually apply that to reduce the footprint of the factories and the labs. Um, in clinical trials, we've looked at packaging and the types of distribution methods that are being used. Um, when you actually look at medicine discovery, um, even some of the labs have been fully automated in order to actually reduce the, the amount of chemistry, the chemicals that you use in that process. Yep. And when you come across the supply chain, um, clearly this uh, tech enables greater visibility across the supply chain. And that's allowing us to look at reuse or re-engineering or returning product back into um, the industry. So there are some things that have been made but I think one of the things you said is what you do to accelerate. And I think acceleration is key, and we've seen that since COP26. And one of the things that's being done with pharma is, um, I think a lot of the innovation we've seen today has been really in our own shop and been driven internally. Yep. And I think what you've seen now is collaboration across the industry far greater than we had before. So if I um, just take one example, Energize when that was announced a few weeks after COP. And Energize is taking 10 of the big pharma companies. It also takes, um, is it Schrader Electric? Mm. And we're actually working with everybody where we've got shared supply chain componentry. Um, companies, whether they're chemical manufacturers, right down to raw material companies, and influencing a reduction in their um, energy consumption. So that's just an example, Roger, that brings that to life. So Thank you very much, Maureen. Actually, very recently, we had an NHS roundtable on sustainability, and it left me gasping. Uh, in this country, we employ 1.3 million people in the NHS. We don't have factories, we have hospitals. We have vast logistics operations, uh, and you can just imagine the amount of energy that that consumes. Fortunately, people are now consulting their doctors virtually rather than physically, but even so, um, this is one of the biggest <laughs> energy uh, requiring sectors in the country, I think, right now. So healthcare isn't just 
farmer. It, it's, it's the whole ecosystem, uh, and much can be done here. So I'd really like to call on Rob from EY. Uh, a, a really interesting question, uh, a comment I, I heard that it's the business partners that are pulling through the sustainability agenda rather than the IT organizations. Uh, and, uh, and that just seems to me to be uh, slightly uh, counterproductive. I mean, surely we should be starting with IT uh, and getting our own house in order. Uh, what, what's your current experience? Yeah, I mean, I think the role of, of IT, I, I sort of think it's in threefold, right? So the fir first is absolutely, you've got to get your own, own house in order. And, and Stuart was talking a bit about that uh, earlier. Um, I, I think it's a little bit hidden as well in IT. Typically, yeah. when I do a lot of work with organizations on net zero planning and, and setting out their net zero strategy, it tends to dominate with the operations, it tends to dominate with the production lines, that the support functions sometimes get overlooked. Um, and frankly, they're not also coming forward and saying, you know, actually, we've got a problem as well, we've got something that we need to play. So I think first, first of all, the most is, it, You've got to step forward and take responsibility and accountability for the, the own the carbon emissions that are, that are sitting in that in that function and the supply chain that supports yeah. that function um, I think secondly uh, and I'll pick on the point Stuart made as well is actually there's a huge opportunity for the IT team and IT departments and CEOs to help the business yeah. with uh, collaborating innovating you know it is a in most organizations, it's a place where innovation is embedded in the way of working, and it's really important that uh, not only you sort your own house out, but actually help uh, the, the, the company uh, more broadly. And, and thirdly, is probably on the data issue. Um, and I think uh, we touched on, on data earlier. I, I always talk about financial data. Obviously, I'm from EY. We're an accounting firm. where We've spent decades building processes systems, controls around financial data. Yeah. Uh, and we rapidly have to do the same on non-financial data. Yeah. Uh, I've got a client who's got about 330 KPIs they measure for their ESG. Uh, about 90% of them are manual. Wow. Uh, if we were going to assure, like we assure our financial statements and assure the non-financial data, I don't think there's a company in the FTSE, we could, we could comfortably move to what we call reasonable assurance, which is the standards of, of, of the auditing profession. So there's a huge amount of work to be done to get uh, the right control and quality around the data. That old adage yes. that you can't yeah. improve what you don't measure. Uh, and so I think IT has got a huge, uh, they may not like it to be honest, because it's, a, it's another big burden coming on top of an already busy agenda. Yeah. Uh, that actually there's gonna be some, some work here to actually capture that data, to put, uh, to amalgamate it, to report it back uh, in a coherent way. Um, and that's, that's going to need some support and help from, from the CIOs and CIO teams, for sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm not hearing a great deal of optimism here. I mean, we've got some massive challenges uh, ahead of us, particularly around data. Uh, I, I don't think we have the, the right tools yet to actually be able to f find, find the data we need to, to use to make the decisions. But if I might, uh, Brad, if uh, bring you back to the, one of the big industries, of course, that um, uh, aerospace and automotive that's um, preoccupied, really, with sustainability, I guess, today. Uh, I'd love to understand from you where you think the mobilization should take place. Should it be from the top or from the bottom? You know, how, how do we get this whole game uh, geared up accelerate to accelerate uh, change sure Th th thank you Roger yeah your, your question is really germane I, I really in appreciated when you brought up the cybersecurity yeah because in, in in here's why if you if we were having the same panel 10 or 12 years ago that would be the topic not yep. sustainability of the planet but sustainability of our IT systems and how our business could survive yep. a deconstruction or attack on our cyber systems. The reason why I think that's an important analogy is because industry has recognized that as a problem and from the board level to the factory floor has addressed that problem. So I think in some ways the pathway for us to address sustainability has been laid out in the past. Mm. So we know that we, we know what we need to do. Yeah. It needs to start at the leadership level to assure that the messages are there. And indeed, if you read annual reports of virtually any 
publicly listed company, you'll see their commitments to ESG well laid out typically and how they're going to go about doing that. That then sets the tone for the rest of the corporation to follow. And they're held to account by the shareholders and in some cases by the SEC recently, as I've seen some reports in the news. I see you've seen them as well, I think. So, so starting top down, you must set the policy. You must make it a priority for your company. And you must explain to both the shareholder as well as to your customers and to your employees why you're doing it, why it's critical for not just the sustainability of your business, but in this case, the sustainability of the planet. So to bring us back to this ecosystem thinking, I think that is really the top down, bottom up. Is It's not an either or, it's both, or it's all the above. And when you look at an organization like, like the one that I'm in, which is the parent company is Rolls Royce, and the R Squared Factory is one of the businesses in the group, we look at all the areas that we can impact the business from a sustainable sustainability perspective. So we make jet engines, jet engines burn jet fuel, which is kerosene based or fossil fuel based. So what can you do at every level? Well, from a leadership perspective, you set your goals, you set your net zero targets to 2050, and then you, you back down from there, back from there what you need to do from here to there to get there. Second of all, you look at what tools do you have in your toolkit right now? Yep. So we have tremendous engineering and, and computing capabilities in our toolkit. Mm -hmm. So the constant drive for higher efficiency is one way of approaching the sustainability issues. Use less fuel to do more work, right? Yep. So that's in our toolkit. We can do that right now. We are doing it right now. And every generation of engine has been better than the one before in terms of efficiency. The next thing you can look at is how is the world changing over time and assure that your products, what you are building, will match the capabilities that are being created in other parts of your market space. So as we move to sustainable air fuels, as we move to electrification, as we move to hydrogen, we want to make sure that all of, our, all of our products are compatible with those three different alternatives and any others that may come about, and do that in a way that allows us to have that goal set in front of us so that when the two things meet together, everything's ready to go, and you can, you're not held back by, well, we can't do sustainable fuels because our engines don't work, or we can't do engines because we don't have, it, that's, just, that's just a non-starter. You have to do all of it at once. And then I think information and data science are two key aspects of that, both from understanding materials and design all the way through to what all the other panels have said about transparency across the business, creation of digital twins to understand your scope one, two, and three um, liabilities and the things that, that are impacting the environment, and then being able to do scenario planning and modeling around those things in such a way that you understand how your decisions at the policy level down through to the factory floor are going to impact your sustainability profile. Those are the things that I think will mobilize businesses generally. I mean, specifically for Rolls-Royce and for aerospace and for the R-squared factory, it's around those things that I mentioned. But I think overall, it's, it's keeping your eye on the big picture, understanding the ecosystem thinking is critical, and then leading from the top and acting all through the organization right down to the factory floor. I think that's the only way we can address this challenge. And you brought up a very interesting point about the equivalence to cyber. So organizations today recognize you can dictate from the top, but you're not actually going to change attitudes unless every individual accepts responsibility. Right. Uh, and again, as individuals, we're getting attacked, cyber attacked in our homes, our mobiles, our PCs. Uh, it's not just going to the office and getting attacked. We're getting attacked everywhere. Uh, so I think individuals are beginning to wake up to the fact that cyber is there and we've got to, actually got to exercise individual responsibility. So I'm just really intrigued, and we can come back to discuss this, how do you get that sort of bottom-up sure. individual uh, sense of responsibility here? Because it is our planet, is it not? Yeah, th thank you. Because there's, there's a real key component that I didn't mention before, which is, we, I talked a lot about technical solutions, and those are absolutely critical, but it's only one side of the coin. Yep. <laughs> Businesses, are, we are all a people-centric organization. Yep. So in order for us to really leverage that technical solution, we have to have cultural change inside our organizations. I mean, with the R Squared Factory having trained over 30,000 employees in some form of digital culture transformation across Rolls Royce, and now extending that training into other industries and market yep. verticals, we find that it's that combination of cultural change, mindset change in your organization, creating a community around digital and around sustainability, 
and then marrying that to the technology with the right policy guidance from leadership and consistency throughout, right? You have to walk the walk as you talk the talk. Mm. And so when you combine those three things together, you have a powerful combination. If you leave one off, it's like three legs of a stool. It, it simply will not stand. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, Andy, last but by no means least, uh, again, you're in a, uh, a very visible sector, automotive sector, uh, and, and, uh, and we're, we're all depending on you to make uh, transportation more eco-friendly. Uh, how do you tackle this whole issue around data uh, and the visibility that data can give you uh, within your own organization, but as the car hits the road? Uh, uh, I think Tesla talk about petabytes of data now yeah. coming from the car. Surely that could be a very valuable way of tackling uh, uh, the environment. It is, and I'm, I'm going to talk about ecosystem again in a moment. But to start with, we had our uh, strategy director, um, Francois Dosa, come and speak to the digital team, the IT team, a couple of weeks ago. And he was asked, what's the, what's the most important thing for the company at the moment? And genuinely, the first word out of his mouth was sustainability. It's about why it mattered. And he doesn't talk about sustainability from the perspective of a car factory or a component or a part. He talks about it from cradle to grave, so this is from the point at which raw materials are either recycled or mined, right the way through to the disposal of the vehicle at the end of its life, which could be yeah. 15, 20 years later. And the problem with that, and you asked me about data, is we don't have all of the data for that entire ecosystem. So I'm charged now with putting a team together, and really the first job for that team will be, can we get the data we need to one, measure where we are now, and then two, show any progress and the progress that we need to make. Uh, we have a new sustainability director, Rosella Cardone, and uh, she's a leader in a hurry. And when I sit and talk to her uh, and her team, uh, every single conversation ends somewhere with data. Mm. And we talk about um, the data within our own operations, scope one, uh, the, data, the, the data about CO2 that we consume. We buy electricity, we buy power. Is it from the right place? How much do we use? What's the CO2 impact? And then we talk about the very long value chain that I mentioned. Where is the CO2 being consumed in that supply chain, in that, in that value chain? And she cares, and we all care. And, and without being able to answer that question, we won't be able to answer the question, which is, well, when are you, when are you net zero? We won't know. So again, ecosystem. We will work with partners that will help us find that data, help us surface that data in ways we can use so that we can prove and show that we're making a difference and we can plan where we can make that difference at, at pace, at speed. Um, and actually, you talked about customers as well. Our, our end use customers are demanding this more and more. Uh, we don't get a choice to do this. If we don't do it, our customers will go to people who do um, we're, we're, we're not the largest of car companies, of course, but we are a big car company and we have a big share of voice in the market. Um, you've probably seen the news 2025, you'll see a new Jaguar, it'll be all electric, um, and that's going to be a very exciting car. And in fact, uh, I printed this, this off this morning from our, our own website. We aim to achieve zero net carbon emissions across the supply chain, all products and operations by 2039. I'm only smiling because Rosella is in a hurry and she would like to beat that time. And uh, our job is to try and help her. So in summary, the data does matter. It's in every conversation. It's probably our number one priority. I think the regulators are going to demand it. We're going to have to prove where we are with our data. We're going to have to prove that we're making the changes to CO2 in the way we, we say we're going to. And if we don't, the customers will hold us to account for it. So we don't have a choice. Thank you very much. So Again, what I'm hearing is, you know, what, what, what would be the real catalyst to drive every organization in the world to take sustainability to the top of the agenda rather than midway down? Uh, and I'm sure we all recognize the power of the customer. Ultimately, nothing gets done unless the customer wants it. Um, maybe the regulator, but that's a sort of negative aspect. Uh, if the customer really believes it, really wants it, then eventually they'll pay for it, they'll find a way of getting it. And as you rightly say, they'll decide which organization they should go to. Uh, should they buy a, a, a Jaguar or should they buy a, 
uh, another car. So I think the whole pressure needs to be around customer demand here as much as anywhere else. I, I don't, can't see anyone else making that much difference uh, to date. So if I may come back to, <laughs> to the beginning again, uh, your industry is looking at some really revolutionary technologies like biomass. Um, is that you know, part of your big long-term strategy? Uh, there's multiple strategies, and it's interesting because it's quite clear there is no one silver bullet to this question, and there is no one solution that anyone's invented yet which is going to solve it. So this is about the ecosystem almost spreading the bait. Yep. So uh, biomass, yes, it is. We see it as a, uh, almost a medium-term fill the gap. Right. But as if you look at population growth, yep. Biomass is uh, potentially taking up space that we're going to need for food. Yeah. Uh, so I just don't think the public is really going to accept that as a long-term solution. Sure. Um, yesterday, we signed an agreement with Rolls-Royce on hydrogen. Really? So we're investing with them in uh, testing. The, the, basically, you can take a fairly standard jet engine yep. and feed it with hydrogen. It's how do you get the density or the volume of hydrogen in an aircraft safely? You have to cool it to 270 something degrees, at, or minus 270 degrees at wow. uh, high pressure. So there's real challenges, but there's a goal there by 2024 to have a test flight on a test engine. So you start building that out and start building on some of these long term bets yes, yes. Uh, as to where you're going to go. Uh, we, no, I say no one thing is going to do it. Another announcement we made um, is a partnership with, uh, and again it comes back to this whole ecosystem thinking, Airbus um, uh, with carbon capture. Yep. And there's about seven airlines signed a deal with Airbus to work and invest in carbon capture. Because even once you get to hydrogen, there's still a net carbon footprint mm -hmm. Yep. 2050, whatever. You still have to do something about it. <laughs> right. And so it's thinking 20 years out as uh, well. And that starts today. Yes, yes, and yes. Getting on the front foot. So it's not just uh, uh, coming back to your earlier point. Yeah, yeah. There are some things we need to sort ourselves out today. Yes. And yeah, I do yeah. think going to the cloud, doing some of these things, it's a small part. Investing our capability in business benefits is a 10x return. Yes. relative yeah. to what we'd sort out on our own. Th like, uh, the fuel one is 10 times what I will sell, uh, save in IT yep. going to yep. the cloud yep. and huge and 10 times the carbon. So I think there's the short-term tactical, but you have to keep your eye on the horizon. Sure. And there is no answer yet. <laughs> and, and that's a real challenge mentally to people. And com sorry, coming back to your other point around yes. cyber, why was that at the top there? <laughs> Economics. Yep, absolutely. So actually, I'm not sure it's Risk. the customer which will drive it. It will be economics yes. drive it. Yes. And the cost of carbon credits, and particularly in the aviation industry, right. is going through the roof. Um, sure. But the economics will drive people to invest and find alternatives, as well as a bit of public pressure and public acceptability. Um, and so you put all that together, it comes down to money, and sh we can solve some of that financial challenge um, with a whole variety of options and alternatives and bringing people together. I'm glad you said that because customers ultimately are driven by economics, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, they, they can talk about a lot of other good things, but when it comes to pay for your holiday, it's going to be an economic proposition. If you can get the economics right, or the regulator has to come in and... and uh, a combination. Uh, yeah. Like a, push you it hard. It won't just be one element of it. I do think the regulator will come in on the carbon. And you already see it with ESG reporting. Yeah. Yeah. There's economic pressure from investment groups to report on your ESG. And they are now auditing what you're reporting. Before it was just a tick box exercise. It's now right. becoming, yeah, you fill it in, but they're now digging in. So there's a, a market regulation emerging. It may not be from the CEA or from the formal. Uh, financial guys, but the market is imposing a level of regulation and reporting discipline. And because we're all having to do it, I think you were saying it's all on spreadsheets. It absolutely is on spreadsheets. You can't sustain that. So we will, we're building data repositories and reporting capability yep. um, and putting pressure on the oracles and uh, Azure's <laughs> and AWS's of the yes. world yep. to yep. give us automated reporting of my carbon consumption right. and where they're getting their power from. 
Yep. <laughs> because that all feeds into our reporting. So the market pressure yes. is building uh, all the way through that. And that's that economics. It's a, it's a pain. It's the right thing to do. Let's make it as economical and as easy and as straightforward. Because it's, if it's easy to do, people do it. Yep, yep. So actually, that sort of builds really nicely, Eleanor, into your second question, which is, what were the pressures that merited a big push towards achieving sustainability within your own organization? Was it the shareholders? Was it the employees? Was it regulators? You know, where, where initially In did order. that pressure come from? Customers, investors, employees, yes. compliance. Interesting. And it, the nuances of these like, drivers changed over time. So first customers. Yes. Uh, they were pressuring um, us in terms of our goals, our targets, our uh, programs and policies. And we went from responding to surveys that were pretty much yes and no checkbox yep. down to really detailed questions on everything that we do from uh, energy management down to uh, you know, supply chain uh, uh, risk uh, from you know, environmental footprint uh, to modern slavery. And the, the, um, we call that survey fatigue in the space. It, you know, you get all these multiple uh, questionnaires uh, that you have to, you know, to respond in, in detail. Uh, but what was interesting in seeing how that evolved is that the depth of the questions drove changes in how we manage some of these pro programs and policies uh, and, and processes internally because we had to go and, and search for, for data and change the way we were doing, you know, uh, um, we were managing these processes uh, as well. Investors, uh, from the beginning, I would say they were looking at how we managed uh, climate change risk. What happened in the last couple of years, though, uh, at the beginning, it was like the, the, you know, we are in some uh, ESG fund, and so we had the investors that were managing these funds sure. you know, talking to us. Now it's everybody. <laughs> and uh, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, you know, I was afraid that the momentum of climate change was going to, to, to fade. And actually, the opposite happened. The, it was almost like a stress test for, for the investment community, and they, we, sort of, we, we have 10 times more the number of inquiries from our investors than we had in the, in the past. Employees were always uh, engaged, but now it's almost impossible to hire talent if you don't show that you have a strong corporate social responsibility commitment. Yep. And um, the board, you know, we started engaging with the board you know, back in the days. Uh, now we have uh, annual uh, meetings with them to explain how we are addressing climate change. But what is, inter what is interesting now is that the finance team is uh, really looking at how we integrate non-financial reporting with their uh, financial reporting, and we are working closely with them to also figure out how we, we blend you know, the, 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 the activities that we, we have in many, in, you know, in many ways done separately over the last few years. So. Uh, all that I'm hearing right now actually suggests we should be writing a manifesto. We really should be writing manifesto. Uh, you've all mentioned some absolutely vital issues, whether it's economics, customers, regulators, data. Uh, this is such a complex landscape, and yet I think there's some simple rules here, actually. I'd really like to see, as a result of this discussion today, a very simple manifesto with probably nothing more than 10 aspects to sustainability, which really should be, you know, become the sort of the written rule f for most organizations. And I think we've got a sufficient you know, authority vested here to actually you know, work on this manifesto together. So I really appreciate that those, those observations, Elena, I think are really important. And again, coming back to yourself uh, in IBM, I mean, this is an um, enormously influential organization. Uh, how would you contribute to your, the manifesto? What would, what would be top of the list in your manifesto? I mean, 
I think there is there is a role in this, and actually a, it's actually a role for everybody really, which yep. is that you know, one of the things that sort of kind of the, at the core of the problem is we built an industrial system which actually didn't cons consider the planet as being something which would last forever and we could do whatever we wanted to it and it, and it would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> it also wasn't very equal. Um, so, so, and we have this whole system which we're now actually trying to unpick. And, and actually what that then requires is you actually have to kind of go back in and sort of, you know, some of the industrial boundaries. So we were talking, you were talking about hydrogen. Well, actually, if, you know, if you start getting into hydrogen, you know, you need to pull in the utilities. You need to pull in sort of the manufacturers. You need to pull in folk like Rolls Royce. You need to pull in people like yourself. You need, to, there's a whole variety of different groups you actually need to kind of pull in. And what it does is it blurs the boundaries of, of industry. It blurs the boundaries of mm. what it is that you do and how it is that you do it. Yes. And, you know, and this, this group and others do have these conversations quite a lot, but it's, it's then around, so well, actually, how, how do you come together? So, you know, how do you kind of you know, convene all of those conversations? Yeah. <clears throat> how do you kind of sort of then work out sort of what the problem is? How do you work out where the value is? Because, I mean, this, this is the other thing. When you start getting into it, if you look within your own business, usually mm. you can do things which actually will make an improvement, but they aren't transformational. If you really want to do the transformational piece, you then have to break it. And if you yep. break it, you then have yep. to break it with somebody else or a group of other people in order to be able to kind of reform it where the value pools actually make sense and you can actually go and tap those as part of the process. So, I mean, I think one of the things that we spend a lot of our time on is acting as that convener. Mm. Um, I mean, the organization is huge. I mean, you know, it's, it's a quarter of a million people who work in my business unit alone, which is quite frightening really at, at, at times. <laughs> and, it, you know, the question is never sort of, you know, do we work with people? It's, it's finding the right person who did. Yes. Um, so we have an opportunity there to really kind of help to act as a convener, mm -hmm. to help kind of pull these pieces together, to actually also then start thinking about how you create some of the platforms and approaches that are needed in order to be able to do that. Because you know, we, we were having these conversations before as well, you know, for a lot of these things, you actually need to create industry standards. You, know, you need to come together. If, you know, if I'm trying to solve a supply chain issue, well, it's my supply chain issue and it will be somebody else's supply chain issue and we'll be using the same suppliers. So actually, how do we do that in a way where we, we do it once? You know, we've got suppliers in, in industries who are getting 40, 50, 60 PDF forms to say, please tell me all of these things that I need. And they're all looking at it and going, well, some of those questions I don't know to answer because, um, you know, it's not kind of core to my business. But, uh, but the rest of them, they're all different. Why, why are they asking me all these different questions? Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do we kind of create the platforms in order to be able to do that? How do we kind of get the data once? Because you were talking about yep. data. Yep. Yep. A lot of the data that we have and the proliferation is duplication. Yes, yes. No, we're all asking for the same stuff. <laughs> if we just ask for it once and shared, then that significantly reduces the burden that we're sort of kind of creating as part of that process. And so it, it, this is not just kind of an IBM role, but, you know, obviously it's something I'm quite passionate about. So we kind of get involved with it a lot. Yes. And we do get involved a lot in building out those platforms and acting as the convener and sort of trying to pull all these pieces together, actually having conversations around how you split value which is not something that as a technology company you'd normally expect. But, you know, we have those conversations around how you split value and who gets what and why. And actually what's really very interesting around those is that for lots of the pieces that we play in, what everybody values is fundamentally different. So actually you don't end up in a situation where everybody's sitting there going, well, I want that piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. They'll have different reasons for doing what it is yep. that they're doing. Not always, but in the majority of cases. So it's actually how you kind of pull that group together. And there's, there's an art to that as well. I'm not saying I know how to do it, but you know, we've had some success at doing it. So that what you're then doing is creating something which actually is splittable, works, non-competitive, actually sort of really kind of starts to drive an industry in a particular direction in yep. order to be able to kind of solve those types of problems. So again, uh, I think some of the most vocal uh, organizations are those big IT suppliers like yourselves, like Oracle, like AWS, like Microsoft. Uh, do you actually talk together? I mean, uh, do the heads of sustainability for our top 10 or top 20 IT organizations sit down in a room together and say, what can we do collectively? We, 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 we do, and uh, not only that, but we all work together too. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I mean, <clears throat> we were having this conversation before, if you kind of look at it, um, show me a diamond in the wall, full career sustainability professional. Yeah. Everybody had a job before, yep, because yep. sustainability until 10, 15 years ago wasn't something that people could kind of make a career on. I'm being a bit pejorative, but, but generally speaking, we are all struggling to get that kind of the levels of resource, the capabilities, yep. 
and, and you know, in order to be able to do this at the speed that we need to, we actually need to draw on each other's skills. So you know, we, we've done quite a lot of work with people like so VY, for example. You know, we are never going to do, be any good at TCFD and ESG reporting. It's not really kind of our core business. We're not an auditor. Um, it's, not, it's not something that we're really good at putting the data. But actually, the digitization of that, and then the structuring if, and, and sort of creating it repeatable, so getting it to a point where it's dynamic, we can do. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying we're the only ones who can do that. But, but, and it's actually sort of how you then pull those pieces together and, yep. and work together. And I think really in, this, in the time frame that we've got, if we weren't doing that, you know, I think it would be a bit derelict, to be honest, because you know, we all need to be working together in order to be able to push the pace that, that we need to and actually pull on the skills that we need to. Because at the moment, we are subscale. And that's across the board. That's not just an IBM issue. That's everybody is subscale. We're subscale in people. We're subscale in, 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 in uh, sort of investment. We're just subscale. Yep. And it's actually about sort of how you match that up. It's not that the money isn't there. If you kind of look out there, there are investors who are looking to place their cash. Yes. But they're finding it very difficult to, play for, to places to actually sort of do it. And we're not making it easy for them. So it's about sort of how you kind of make all of those moving parts move together. So again, um, one of the reasons you and uh, Elena are, uh, are joining us on the stage was uh, the cabinet office in the UK. Uh, the lady in charge actually looks after, I think, the top 20 strategic relationships across the whole IT industry. Isn't that a great place to start? <laughs> I mean, the government spent billions with you guys. Um, I would suggest, you know, again, after this meeting that we go back to the cabinet office and say, how, how can you guys, you know, uh, help build this collaboration more actively because you're absolutely right you know, who's got the resource uh, where's the money going to come from everyone's under tight budget pressures right now including the IT industry so uh, I, I suspect it's got to be a, a broader collaboration supported certainly in this country by cabinet office um, because they 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 do have a substantial buying power uh, which they could bring to bear so uh, Maureen, again, coming back to the farmer industry and, and your particular interest today in innovation. <laughs> uh, it's a topic that I think you and I have probably talked about uh, a lot. Um, companies aren't very good at innovating, are they really? Um, and many, many of the big corporates today are you know, hard pressed just to keep up with growth uh, revenue uh, matching the RPI index. I mean, if you look at growth rates in this country, if you look at productivity in this country and across Europe, you know, it, it's incredibly stagnant. So where is the innovation going to really come from? I mean, how, how do we break through this inertia uh, and, and, and build genuine sustainable innovation? So um, I, I would, I'll be honest with you, I think in pharma, the key drivers are around innovating new medicine yep. for unmet medical needs or actually improving the medicines that we've got and getting them to patients faster at lower cost. But one of the big farmers I've worked with recently, um, we're trying to understand the case for sustainability. And we looked across the medicines portfolio of all the products that we're driving innovation for. And 90% of them also had sustainability benefits. Mm. So rather than it being an either or, I'm gonna argue for the and. So we can create a business case for sustainability and do the benefits and driving for our patients. So one example is at the Medicines Manufacturing Innovation Centre, where I'm now chair. We are um, driving an innovation, a digital innovation, actually around looking at automating clinical trial packaging yes. and automating quality dashboards for QP release. That all was done on the basis with partnering with Big Pharma in order to improve the speed at which you get things to market and also um, the cost of getting things to market. But actually, if you look at it, it actually also reduces fundamentally the waste in the process. And therefore, you're getting a, a fairly significant sustainability benefit as well. So, I mean, the pandemic enabled Big Pharma to take drug discovery down from decades to years. I mean, that has been an incredible innovation in the whole industry. I mean, can you use that sort of knowledge, capability, and apply it in all aspects of what you do today? And that's where you're looking at 
innovation in the chemistry and the science. Yes. And what you're starting to see is platform technologies like RNA platform, um, which is a platform on which you can then create other medicines. And I think that is one of the directions of travel we're seeing in the industry, um, particularly around medicines to, to drive improvements. Thank you. So, Rob, you're, you, you belong to a very large organization. I don't know how, how many hundreds of thousands of people work at EY, but I do know, having been a consultant myself, we spend a lot of time on planes. We spend a lot of time traveling, uh, rushing around, helping our clients. Uh, how do you as an organization address uh, net zero? Uh, how can you make your workforce more sustainable? <laughs> well, <clears throat> can I say something quite controversial? So, uh, 2019, we set our, our net zero ambition. We've got 350,000 people, by the way, Roger. So we've got quite a few people <laughs> yep. uh, all around the world. And 2019, we set our net zero ambition for 2025. <laughs> wow. So we, we, we did a good job to get our executive excited. We got our chief, chief exec, our chairman. We, we really worked hard to get them and then almost too well. <laughs> and then we, hit, we looked at the competitors and they were 2035, 2030. We want 2025. So we sort of got what we wanted. And then like whenever you have a big win, you celebrate the big win for about a, a minute and then you think, how in the hell are we going to deliver this? Yep. You start to feel sick. Um, my controversial statement is, Thank goodness COVID came <laughs> because it taught our firm and yeah, our industry yeah, yeah. Uh, to work in a very different way. Uh, our, yeah. We have a lot of people, but our business is pretty simple uh, and our carbon footprint is predominantly travel, yeah. predominantly flights. Yeah. And you're absolutely right, Roger, if you've ever met a consultant, there's nothing they love more than their uh, gold card, uh, <laughs> bonus card from the airlines. Yeah. So, the cultural change, mm. we, we got a massive kicker because we had an event which stopped people uh, getting on planes and then they learned to work in a different way. The challenge we have now, of course, is as we all come, you know, come out of that very strange period, how do we not go back to mm. that, that behavior? And I think it's a really interesting point around behavioral change. Um, we, we are not doing enough ourselves. Um, I geekily studied uh, a lot of net zero plans, and one thematic that's missing from the majority of them, if not all of them, is the behavioral element, mm -hmm. both on employees, but also on customers. How are you gonna change the behavior of your customers to buy in a different way, procure in a different way? And how are you gonna change the culture of your organization to, um, to work in a different way? Uh, so, so for us, we, we got, I say, a little bit lucky that we had an event that taught us and accelerated, I think, a journey which would have been really difficult for us. Now it's around embedding uh, a new culture and a new way of working. But I think yeah, behavioral change, cu customer change is, is a slightly uh, untapped. And, and you said before, Roger, you said, um, well, I was depressing you when I said, <laughs> we, we, I get asked a lot around what, what makes you um, optimistic about the future, or are we all doomed? Mm -hmm. And my organization is also full of, you know, our average age is below 30. So we are a very young organization as well. Mm. And Elena, you made the point as well around employees. We talk a lot about customers and yep, customers yep. driving change, but you're absolutely right. Customers make economic decisions. Yes. Yep. So they'd like to take the, the, the lower, the sustainable option. But if it's more expensive, even though they want to, they probably won't. Employees, however, don't have that challenge. Mm -hmm. They are demanding, they are aggressive, <laughs> they, they want change and they have options. They don't have to work for you. Right. Uh, so I, I see that the power of the employee and the power of the consumer, but I think actually it's more about the power of the employee. In an environment where we have huge war for talent in all industries, uh, attracting and retaining talent in a to an organization that's not taking this seriously, mm. it is, you know, it's just not going to be viable going forward. So I look at that side, and then the top end, and we've talked about this before, I went to COP26, I was fortunate to go to COP26. The one thing I learned at COP26, so well, actually, I learned many things, but the main thing I learned was, let's not wait for government, right? Mm. They will not, <laughs> regulation will not make this happen. Uh, corporates, businesses, need to make this net zero transition. 
we can't wait for regulation, we don't need it. Yeah. So I think we've got a, consumers that are going to drive it, our employees are going to drive it. Yeah. And the other thing that happened at COP26, my kids get excited when they meet Mason Mount. Uh, I, I've got to meet Mark Carney, he's my hero. Mark Carney mm. moved the money. Yep. And when the money moves, industry moves. And we talked a little bit about the reporting. You know, the big asset owners are being more yep. demanding of the asset managers. Yep. The asset managers are now asking the questions of, of us as corporates. They're all setting out their stalls, slightly different. You know, BlackRock is, is very much on environmental, mm. legal in general yep. and social. Vanguard's more sort of governance. Mm. And all, all that pressure is building from the top. And then we've got our consumers and our employees pressuring from the bottom. Right. And, and that's what gives me confidence that, that the organizations that win will be those who respond to that. And the organizations yeah. that drag their heels will get caught. So yes, we do a lot of TCFD reporting as part of our business, but I don't get excited about that because it's lagging. Um, I get more excited about the leading, which is what's happening with financial services with their alignment of, their, of the money to net zero. And I love stirring our employees <laughs> to be more, you know, be more inquisitive, to be more aggressive in their asks and to be real um, agitators. Mm -hmm. Because frankly, boards, executive teams, they need to be agitated. They, they, they need it and they need something to respond to. But again, don't your customers need to look your consultants in the eye? They're paying per day rates. They want to see Fred. They want to see Fred in their office. Isn't that a, a barrier? A that, that's, that's exactly the point around this behavioral change of employees yep. and customers. Yep. So one of the things we're doing is we've put a tool into our teams, into the hands of our teams to say, you can calculate the carbon footprint of your job. Mm. Put it in the bid. That's interesting. Yep. And then share it with a client and say, how could we collectively mm. reduce you know, the, the carbon of this engagement yeah, by not traveling to uh, yep. you know, yep wherever it is around the world. Um, and if you can get the commitment, and the other thing is, we're a scope three as well. We're a supplier. Yeah. So when you remind clients sometimes that we're a scope three, we can reduce your, your scope three emissions, mm. um, you can start to get some of that behavioral change. But you have to, you have to go and have those conversations. Yeah. You can't just leave it to chase. But it can become, and I think it will become, much more of a competitive advantage for, for organizations to to talk about what they're doing and how they can help client, customer, in their scope three, because we're all part of a, you know, as a, as a supplier, you're always a scope three provider to a client. Thank you. So Brad, uh, we, we talk a lot about AI and machine learning. It's the, it's the buzzword today. Uh, does this technology bring, bring uh, light to the problem here? Uh, can, we, can we really deploy AI and machine learning to to, to solve these uh, sustainability issues? I, I think the short answer to that is yes, by no surprise <laughs> that I would say that. Um, but let's, let's put it into some context, if we mm. will. And, and I, liked, I tried to bring context from your cyber analogy earlier. We, 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 there are two anniversaries occurring right now. One is today is the 53rd anniversary of landing on the moon. And if you think about net zero 2050, it's, it's beyond a moonshot, right? It's even yeah. bigger than that. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing about that goal is that it, it, there's no losers. Like in the space race, there was a clear winner, clear loser definition yep. between the Western countries, the US, United States, and the Soviet Union. That's, we all win if we solve this one. And there's, the second anniversary is, is the start of that, which is 60 years ago on September 12th, was the speech in Rice University under the sweltering heat like it was yesterday, but that's common in Texas where Kennedy laid out his famous, we shall go to the moon within this decade, et cetera, et cetera. That's a great line, and I encourage everybody to go on YouTube and watch the speech. But the second line is even better, and it's something like, he says, that goal would serve to organize the best of our abilities, and it's a challenge we're not willing to put off, something of that nature. And it really struck me about organizing the best of our abilities. So when you talk about AI and machine learning, I'm gonna to try to make the thread leap back here. It really underlines the philosophy of what we've discovered in the R squared factory within Rolls Royce. And that is investing in collaboration across your businesses mm. combined with the tools and techniques of AI and machine learning are what solves the hardest problems. Mm. 
So what we're trying to do is bring other sectors and industry together to collaborate. So if I were to say, what should you invest in? I say, invest in that collaboration. And by doing so, you want to bring about a few things. One of the things is you want, we talked about data, and there's, they say data is new oil, which I find to be an unfortunate pun in, in this <laughs> yep. context. So we'll say data is new gold, yep. right? But it's, it's the ability to share data and to access data across sectors that will help, particularly when you're talking about supply chains where all of our stuff gets on the same boats a lot of times and has to move across the world. So you have to invest in data and data transparency. And then you have to invest in the models of your business. So the digital twin that acts on the data to understand how mm -hmm. your business actually works is really critical. And that's yeah. a very, very complex question um, on how to do that. And you have to be very nuanced in terms of being able to model with varying degrees of certainty in the operations of your business, yeah. varying degrees of uncertainty in the marketplace and in political and social unrest in far-flung places where you might have a manufacturing facility. And then finally, you need to have the AI machine learning tools. And all those things need to operate together in that collaborative environment for us to be able to address this problem. It's just too big for any one of us to do on our, by ourselves. Yep. So we believe very strongly, and this is how we act on it, and we'll be talking about this tomorrow morning in our chalet at 11 o'clock with supply chain people, um, about how you can work together collaboratively to address these big problems in sustainability. So I encourage anyone who's of interest to come and join us in the Rolls-Royce Chalet at 11 a.m. Sorry for the shameless plug for our meeting, but this is where we want to sit down across the industry sectors and figure out how can you bring the best and brightest people to the R-squared factory and work with us in a collaborative way to put the tools in place with the data, with the models, and really solve this hard problem. We're not going to be able to do it individually. It's I just axiomatic. We will never do it individually. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Andy, uh, you talked about life cycle of the car and, and the importance of understanding raw materials to to the end of the product life cycle. Uh, what about IT? I mean, again, is it important for us as IT professionals to understand life cycle uh, of our data centers, of our laptops, of all the equipment that we use, all the hard assets that we use? Um, it is, and, and there's, a, there's a, a beautiful analogy between what we need to do as part of a digital IT organization and what we need to do with our, uh, with our product, with the cars we build. So how we procure uh, and what we procure really matters. There are really good partners to work with who are very free with their information, uh, who have very, very strong CO2 targets of their own. So part of scope three, thinking what you buy and where you buy from. And that's just, that's just the product. At the same time, services, we've talked four or five times here about data centers. There are good data centers and bad data centers. Mm. Go to the right ones, find the data centers that can help you best with your scope three targets. Um, then you're gonna use them and you can try and use them responsibly, just, just as a customer should with a car. Mm. So, uh, and that helps us with other issues like we've talked about security and cyber. Um, but through the life of those products, sweat them, sweat the assets, get the most value out of them as you can. Don't buy, 50 servers if you can get away with 20. So think about every decision you make all the way through. Be flexible if you can. And then at the end of the life, at the, the end of it, what are you going to do with that product? It can have a second, third, fourth life before it ever goes into a circular economy that brings it all the way back to the beginning. I think I was talking to somebody on the panel earlier, 98% of a, of, a, of a server is, is recyclable, you know, from the frame to the kit inside it is useful. Now, in a company like ours with 37,000 uh, employees and six, seven factories dotted around the world, we have tremendous buying power. So why not make conscious, firm decisions about how you procure, what you procure, who you procure with and partner with through the ecosystem, and then how you dispose of at the end of the life. And it will all contribute to the, the scope three targets that you've, that you've got. And you can talk about it. That includes services. I was interested in the conversation um, that we've just had here. Again, we're going to talk about ecosystem. So, and, and I want to add a point about employee, because everybody's raised mm. I was going to raise it. I did say I was putting a team together. It's not a plug, don't worry, I'm not looking for it. Um, but the, I've had no problem finding fantastic 
resources who, who are applying for these roles. There's a real internal and external, the pent up interest in getting involved in the sustainable agenda is profound. I mean, I've had 30 CVs for some roles and you look at them and they're very, very good. People are interested. If we don't provide these opportunities and if as a company we don't live up to these opportunities, we'll struggle to, to, to find staff and we'll struggle to retain staff because people care. So it is a, it's a massive internal push that we need to meet. Thank you. I notice we're, we're beginning to run out of time and we actually have received a lot of interesting questions from the audience. Uh, so I, I hope we've kept you thoroughly engaged and active. And I do want to say we need to bring a, a lot of these insights and observations together post, post this event and really start sharing them and, uh, because I think what we have discussed today is so fundamentally important to this, this big question. Uh, so look at uh, a number of uh, questions here. Uh, it, first one, is the panel seeing a shift in focus of product development to design out carbon dependency and overhead and can tech support enable this? So are we really focusing on uh, a, a carbon neutral product? I mean, again, perhaps uh, from Je uh, your, your uh, Andy, your <laughs> experience there. Uh, Very definitely. Um, and it's not, just, um, it's not just the product itself, it's not just the magnesium parts or steel or aluminium. Aluminium is a really useful metal and as you're probably aware, JLR uses a lot of it. Where do you get it from? So yep. there, are, there are highly efficient ways of, of processing aluminium, not just recycling but actually when you get it out of the ground and, and certain uh, choices that you can make about where you get it from, are you going to drag it all over the world? Yep. how it's processed before you get it or contribute to your scope three targets. So it, it ranges from raw materials, physically where they are, yep. it, to the choice of materials in the product, is it recyclable? And the way that material has been procured in the first place, has it been done in a, in a, in a sensible way? And the answer to your question is yes, all those considerations are now being factored and have been for some time actually into the way the product itself is designed. So thank you. The, uh, the, the second question is uh, about IT itself. We tend to thrive on innovation. You know, we're always in search for the new, uh, and that sort of filters down to consumer uh, uh, IT. We're always after the next uh, generation of iPhone or, or Android, etc. I mean, are we going to be able to give up this passion for just consuming for its own sake? Uh, I'm really interested. I mean, I, I recently... Uh, went to seek an upgrade of my mobile phone, and I thought, there's nothing new here. Why would I want to bother? Uh, but, you know, m billions of people are <laughs> uh, replacing their laptops every two or three years, replacing their mobile phones. We're creating a problem for ourselves, are we not? Any comments on this? <laughs> Stuart? Yeah, I, th I think it's changing. Uh, yeah. If you look at the new uh, right to repair regulations, yes. so yeah. Yeah. Cause the biggest failure in most phones and modern tech is a battery. Yes. Yeah, and up yeah. until recently, you couldn't change the, the battery and a lot of that stuff, or it was just really cumbersome. So simple little things like that are changing. And I think it's incumbent on us as IT professionals, things like your servers and your data center. Right. Why do you have to change them every three, four years or five years? Now, why not go and buy things that are recycled or just replace yes. the bit yep. that needs to be replaced? I mean, there is a lot to do. There's some happening. Yeah, yeah. But it comes back to, I think someone mentioned, well, behavior. How do you incentivize us collectively as an industry and the general public to change their behavior? Sure. Uh, and there's lots of little things and nudges around that I think can help. I think the right to repair is great. Um, I think there's a lot more. And I think companies should be supporting yes. uh, their hardware for more than the three years and then sort yep. of set the support tough. Um, which is kind of what forces us to go and upgrade or, uh, and buy new. So there's, a, there's a, a motivation, I think, we can exert pressure on some of these suppliers. A lot of that then comes back down to data again. So, you know, it, I mean, if you look at a lot of products, I mean, you were talking about sort of hardware, it's all modular. Yeah. You know, I, I can switch it in and out if you like. I mean, you can keep the core of it and we'll just add bits or we'll take pieces out. So it's, it's completely up to you, it's configurable as part of that process. 
but you know, a big part of this, and you know, we, we do a lot of work in, the, in sort of consumer spaces. Mm. So we can actually provide you now with data which says exactly where your product came from. You know, who did it? Actually, you can, you know, we, we've even got tech now where if you want to, to tip your coffee grower, not your coffee barista, yes. but your yep. coffee grower, we can do that too. So we've got all of those pieces to, to sort of actually sort of get the enactment um, piece going. It's actually how, to your point, do you then get that into the psyche? Do you get it used? Yes. How do you actually sort of then, how does that then start to do the nudges to actually sort of influence behavior? So how do you actually sort of start moving away from the consumerism piece and actually sort of valuing consumerism, which is kind of part of the issue. We, we, because we always thought it was a bit of a throwaway world and actually we always wanted the latest thing, that's created a particular way of thinking and, and it's actually that which we have to shift. Um, and you know, to your point, I mean, it is around a whole series of nudges, it's around data, it's around it's all the things that we've been talking about. So again, you know, one of the classic reasons for upgrading your PC is you, you're running out of memory. Uh, you're running out of battery. Uh, at least now most of our stuff is in the cloud, but it is being stored somewhere. It's actually consuming power somewhere, but it's not consuming power in my house. And again, I think this just needs a public awareness of what we're actually doing here. We're just pumping all this vast amount of data into the cloud somewhere. Uh, it's, it hasn't gone away. Uh, it's consuming, you know, resource. Uh, so how, how do we bring some sort of discipline into our own lives as well as our corporate lives? Economics. <laughs> Good, yeah, economics. The storage of data is so cheap. Yeah, yeah. There is absolutely no incentive for anyone to go and delete the 200 photographs they take today. There's only two that they actually want. They've taken 200. How do you, what's the most? It's not costing them anything. No. Nope. So why worry about it? It's economics and it's ease. Yes. Yeah. So I've got to make it as easy to be sustainable as not. I mean, you know, if you kind of think about it, you know, we all know we should drink less, eat more healthy, do more exercise. And that has a, a short term physical benefit to you. And yet we're not very good at it. So we're actually asking people to change their behaviors and what they do. Yep. Something they can't see, can't touch. They feel it in the round. Yesterday would be a classic case in point but they don't feel it and sort of feel it on an individual basis. So there's no feedback loop. So you know, if you're then sort of forcing people to make a choice and actually you're making the sustainability choice tricky or difficult or, or, or just different, yeah. then, then you know, it's gonna be problematic. So th you also have to kind of think through, so how do you make su being sustainable as easy as not being sustainable? And I think that's part of the trick. It's part of all the things that we're designing and building. It's part of the trick is to sort of actually not force people to do it is actually kind of take it out of their hands and just make it the way it's done so if you come back to the point that rob was making around the uh you know the covid and and how we actually stand to, to learn to work from home a lot more yeah you know i had been working in tech for years trying to promote the value of video conferencing but until there was a fundamental reason for change it didn't happen <laughs> right you know and you could never convince somebody not to fly to a location in order yep. to do something, but COVID actually made that happen. So I think fundamentally, we're gonna to have to find the reason, what's the carrot mm. that actually changes the behavior um, to drive some of these changes we're talking about. Which just actually uh, got the, the final question here was, has, has COVID made a difference that will be long lasting? Uh, is it really going to change our work patterns, our life patterns? Uh, personally, it's changed mine. I'm not sure around the table here. Has it really changed your travel patterns? Um, Stuart, traveling uh, more or less? I'm traveling a lot less. Um, okay. I'm in the office two, something three days a week. Right. Uh, at home, the others. Um, the, the travel, air, aviation travel, um, isn't back up yet. Although what you're looking at now, the transatlantic mm. travel yeah. is, in fact, there was a, 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 something on LinkedIn the other week the first of the uh, the first of July was busier than 2019 first of July in transatlantic flights Unbelievable. so that is yep. coming back yeah because people have an expectation yes and a desire to travel whether it's business or leisure there's an expectation so I think some of the doom mongers which are doing about the death of air travel it's not there's still a, a need for yeah. it yeah yeah for what purpose etc I can't yeah. comment on that but it's uh, still there. so personally yes I'm traveling a lot less uh, and people are changing in that. I think Please. we also, it um, comes a little bit back to, back to data and information in, in informing people. So yes. 
we have a lot of debate around, is it, is it better to have a hybrid working environment from a carbon perspective? It's a great question, especially here in the UK, where we've got poorly insulated homes, uh, heating, so we're heating all working from home, keeping our homes hot all during the day, which we didn't in the past. We've still got the office open, so we've still got all the yep. emissions happening from heating the office or from cooling or from whatever it is. We need some, in order to embed behavior, you need some consolidation and you need to know that what you're doing is the right thing. And I think that's one of the things that we're missing. Um, it comes back to things like carbon ledgers and we make choices on food because we see a little red label on, on the package which says it's high in salt. We all yeah. could not have that then. Um, we, we, we will, I think we will get to a point where people will start to be, we need to inform consumers around the choices they make. Yes. Um, and that comes down to things like working from home. Is it better for the planet to work from home and, and travel less? I think people think it is, but then you hear, so you read and you, you can get confused. And so actually maybe we should all be in the office because um, of, of the heating challenge. I think we'll, we'll need to continue to educate, to nudge behavior. And then, and to your point, there'll be some things that will just, you know, the, the events that we can catalyze on um, some things we need to take away, and that's where governments, I was dissing governments before, that's where governments and regulators can come in by removing options that we all know are, yep. uh, are poor options. Um, but, but I do think providing more information, like we've yep. done on yep. other, other issues, will be a big driver for behavioral change. Excellent. Well, I'm looking at the time. We're, uh, we're out of time, but I'd really like to thank all of you. Uh, really exceptional discussion this afternoon. One that I want to main sh maintain. I think we need to, to uh, write this manifesto. <laughs> it's, uh, it's an urgent need uh, to just really start, try and simplify uh, what needs to be done here based on all the experience that we have around the table. So again, many, many thanks to the audience uh, for coming and participating and for yourselves. And last but by no means least, Eleanor, you're going to lead uh, Meet the Expert uh, session after yes. this. So yes. please, could you tell us more about that? Um, we're going to discuss how to decarbonize supply chains and uh, Carrick and Brad will, will join me as well as um, two of my colleagues from Oracle uh, at you know, 1545. So please you know, join us and uh, we are going to discuss a very important challenge that we all face. Uh, Excellent. Again, thank you also for hosting that session. You're welcome. Uh, really encourage people to join Eleanor and her team and, and of course our other client, uh, uh, other partners here. Thank you all. Uh,